Hello, I'm Pastor Dwayne, and this is my beautiful bride, this great gift of God in my life, Miss Cameron. And we come personally here to invite you into one of our live services. From time to time, we like to broadcast the live service. Cameron and I love to sit here and teach you the word and communicate with you on this level. But some of our viewers contact said, man, we just love when you preach mm -hmm. and when you stand in the pulpit and the anointing comes through. So today we're going to join one of our live messages that we've preached recently. And I know and believe that God's going to use it greatly in your life. And it'll be an encouragement to you, strengthen you in your walk. And I pray God that the, the, the anointing of heaven will come through this screen Amen. and touch your life as he touched many lives in this service. So join us today in this live broadcast of a message that God has given me. Hope you are blessed. Very unique, very unique. In the background here, stop, go back to that picture. This is actually in a Druze village. Uh, these are descendants of Abraham who actually follow the teachings of his father-in-law Jethro. These are Syrian people who've just come over the border and settled in villages. And by the way, best meal, best lunch meal we had was in this village. And uh, in the background is Mount Hermon covered with snow. And that Druze village was full of snow and uh, so this was the coldest trip I've ever been on since 1998. <clears throat> but that's Mount Hermon in the background. And uh, then, of course, the Temple Mount in the background in the next picture, where we're staying on the Mount of Olives, teaching and preaching. And that's, of course, the Temple Mount, the most famous shot of all time you see on television all the time. I th sea of Galilee again. I think that's probably about it. We've got thousands of photographs literally between us and some others will be sharing in the next few weeks a little bit here and a little bit there. And um, <clears throat> I was, I've got my message on the prophetic to preach, but I just felt led to, to just kind of just kind of put a little bow on top of this today. For me, every trip is new. The weather was totally the opposite of Every time I've ever been, it's usually, even though it's February when we go normally, it's usually very warm, 60, 70, and, I'm, and it was the coldest it's ever been. But most, for the most part, beautiful in Jerusalem when we went to the tomb. It was raining and cold, and, but other than that, the weather was fine. But we start out at the Dead Sea. We visit Qumran. We visit Masada, make our way to Jerusalem, and um, so many different places you can go. But... Here's, here's the revelation. If you were to ask me, what's the one revelation you want people to take away from this trip? This is what I'm going to say may be very controversial for a lot of believers, but it's truth. The reason that we choose Ellie and we use him as a tour guide is because not only has he archaeologically validated these places where beyond any shadow of doubt, these places prove the Bible, whether it is on the side of Mount Zion, where we stood in the very place where Abraham brought a tithe of his victory spoils to Melchizedek. We stood in the very place. Ellie discovered this place in 2010. We were the first tour, guide, tour group to ever get to go in there in 2017. And now they've opened it up and uncovered even another room. But you go into this place where they were sacrificing animals. The blood of the animals was flowing down into the spring Gihon. They were skinning the animals. They were making olive oil. They were making wine. They were making bread. And Abraham comes to this place, the oldest place of worship on the earth. And I think that every person who went there was so overwhelmed. I tried to explain to them when you step in this place, it's going to be more anointed than any place you've ever been. But then there's a fourth room where David brought the Ark of the Covenant and sat it there for 33 years. Wow. This place was not even known until 2010, and he discovered that place. And so anointed and just so full of the presence of God. That's always a highlight for me since uh, 2017 to go into that place where God was worshipped by, Seth, by Shem, the son of Noah, who was Melchizedek. He was of that order, Melchizedek priesthood. 
Abraham comes and worships. And then it's always a tremendous highlight, of course, of course to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and uh, to be there, time of reflection. Always, of course, to go to the place where Jesus was crucified at Golgotha to share about what really happened there. You know, um, one of the reasons it's called that's because when David killed Goliath, he cut his head off. And he brought his skull and he buried it under the mountain of Golgotha, yeah. the place of the skull. That's the place where Jesus put his foot on Satan's head and crushed him on the cross. And then to walk into that tomb where they laid the body of Jesus. But the reason that I take people there and the reason that I use Ellie is because he uses archaeological scientific fact and then biblical understanding and then the revelation that God gave me on Jesus the rabbi to prove this. Listen to me. Now this is controversial. If you are a follower of Yeshua as the Hamashiach, the Messiah, are you ready? Buckle up. You're not a Christian. The, the air just, I felt the air suck out of the room. You're not a Christian. You are a follower of Christ, a disciple of Jesus, the Messiah. Do you realize Christianity was never formed until it was formed? by the councils of Evira and Nicaea in, four, in the 4th century, in, three, in the 390s, by what became known as the Catholic Church. You're not a Christian. You're a person who's been grafted into the covenant of Abraham as the seed of Abraham. Christianity is paganism. Hang on to your seat. You say, well, I've been known as a Christian all my... I know it's an innocence, but I'm telling you the truth. Yeshua is not coming back for Christians. He's coming back for those who are followers of his Amen. kingdom. Yes, and Ellie took archaeology and I took the Bible and we proved to people that Christianity was man-made right. by the Catholic Church in the fourth century. But until that time, they were followers of Yeshua as the Messiah. Yes. You happen to be sitting in a church and have the privilege to have teachers, myself and others that come here that understand that we're returning to our foundation. And our foundation is to be followers of the Messiah. When Jewish people are completed in Messiah, they don't become Christians. They become completed in the covenant of Abraham as a follower of the Messiah. Our boat captain on the faith boat out on the Sea of Galilee, well, he didn't call himself a Christian. He said, I am a believer in Yeshua HaMashiach. He is my Messiah. Amen. He's a full-blooded Jewish man who has come to the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. Wow. You've heard Dr. Randy Caldwell say this many times, and I'll say it too. The greatest, the greatest challenge Jesus will encounter when he returns will be from the modern church. The modern church will hate him because he will prove that he didn't come to establish a religion. Amen. He came to show you a way of life as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Amen. But one of the most touching moments truly was at Magdala on that last morning. This is one of the places, one of the few places that you can go and you can look, you can see the synagogue there at Magdala. You know that you know without any doubt the feet of Jesus stood there in that synagogue. That he preached and taught in that synagogue. Wow. There's a figure in the Bible that was with Christ from very early on in his ministry right up to his death and his resurrection. And her name was Mary of Magdala. Yes. It's like Ellie said, in our culture... The last name doesn't matter. It matters that you are Mary and you're from Magdala and that's how you're known. And we don't know exactly where or exactly how she met Yeshua. But we know that she was a prostitute. She was a sinner. We know that she was an outcast. In that culture, she could not have gone into that synagogue. She would have been cast out. She was unclean. She was unfit. She was rejected by religion. And she came to this somewhere in that region, I suppose, because she heard about a rabbi with shmika, a rabbi with authority who is actually inviting people 
to participate in a relationship with the Father, not be a part of a religion. And when you go to Israel, the contrast between religion and the authentic relationship with God is so evident. Because religion has built a church on top of everything they could. But these little places that are still the authentic place where Jesus taught, she came somewhere along the way and she met this rabbi who forgave her, who embraced her. Mary Magdalene followed him everywhere he went. And then we, we find a story later on where she obviously had followed him into Jerusalem. And Jesus goes into the one of the, the Pharisees' home, a man named Simon, in Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she, was, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. Let me just say that according to the Hebrew law, she was out of order. She was not allowed in that house. She was not allowed to enter into that Pharisee's home, lest everyone in there become unclean. That's what religion does. Religion says, you can't come near God. You're not worthy. And so she comes with this flask of fragrant oil, stood behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair. And she kissed his feet, anointed them with a the fragrant oil. Again, the moment in the Hebrew culture that this rabbi allows this woman to touch him, not just her, but any woman, he could not be touched. He becomes unclean. But Jesus didn't come to establish a religion with a bunch of rules. He came to destroy the rules and to make access to God possible for everybody. And so she washes his feet with her tears, dries them with her hair. And this Pharisee, this religious legalist, he spoke to himself saying, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is touching him. She's a sinner. And Jesus answered and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, say it, teacher. And he said, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors and one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which one of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus said, you've rightly judged. And he turned to this woman and said, do you see this woman? I've entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. She's washed my feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman anointed me with the fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she loved much because to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. But he turned to her and said, your sins are forgiven. And he tells her in verse 50, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. Rabbi Yeshua came to fulfill the law and to rewrite the rules so that every one of us could kiss his feet and could wash his feet with our tears and could touch him and know him. Yes. That was an impossibility. You must understand that Jesus was not a carpenter who showed up on the scene just as a savior to establish some religion so that people would follow him. He didn't just come so that you could be forgiven and go to heaven when you die. He came to establish a relationship with you so that you could know him and that you could have a daily walk with him so that you could experience him so that you could bring others into his kingdom. Yes. It's not about Christianity. This is about a relationship with a Messiah yes. because he is coming back. Hallelujah. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives where we stood. Yes. He's going to walk through the Kidron Valley and he's going to Walk through that gate that's sealed, that eastern gate. He's going to, the Muslims have put a, put a cemetery at the foot of that gate because it's not kosher for a rabbi to enter into a cemetery unless he become unclean. Well, he's just going to raise all of them from the dead. 
and walk through that gate and sit on the throne of his father David, he is going to smite the nations, as Revelation 16 says, in that great valley. As far as the eye can see, there's no way to describe how big that valley is. As far as you can see, he's going to rule the nations of the earth, and destroy those who've come against his kingdom, and sit as the Messiah on that throne. This is certainly a life-changing trip, but the greatest, most phenomenal, life-changing experience is for you to know the Messiah personally. So I want you to bow your head, and I want to listen to talk to those online, those who are here today in this room, and I want to tell you that Jesus is a tender, loving Savior. The only people he ever got sideways with were religious people who thought they knew it all. But today, it doesn't make any difference if you're in the gutter of life, if you are hung out, strung out, if you are rejected, overwhelmed, defeated. Jesus loves you. And he came for you. You know, he plainly said, I didn't come for those who don't need a Savior, who believe they haven't sinned. He told the Pharisees, you don't need me. You, you, you don't believe you've broken the law, but there's a whole lot of people that know that they know that they know that they are messed up. Those are the people I came for. How many of you are glad Jesus came for those kind of people? Aren't you glad he came for you? He came for me. So those watching online or in this room, if you've never, ever, ever surrendered your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, I'm not asking you to become a Christian. I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm not asking you to do anything religious. I'm asking you to accept his love. Period. Just accept his love. And through that love, you receive the grace of God to forgive you of all those things that you have been wrong at. And you're receiving the mercy of God to do away with the judgment that you and I deserve. That's called salvation. But it's not just a ticket to heaven. It is a lifestyle of living and knowing a resurrected Savior who's interested and involved in every aspect of your life every day, from your personal relationships to your finances to your business to your family. Jesus is a way of life. He's not just the way to life. He is a way of life. If you've never, ever, ever met Christ, you can pray right now and say, Lord, I want to know you. And I'm asking you to forgive me and come into my life as my Savior and my Lord. He will. He will transform you and change you little by little, day by day. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray right now for every person watching online and every person in this room that we would make a choice, a decision today to be a follower of the Messiah and to introduce our world to a loving, compassionate, forgiving Savior who doesn't want anything from them and he doesn't want to make a religious zealot out of them. He just wants to have a relationship with them and shower them with love, grace, forgiveness, mercy. Just shower us with your love in this place today and watching online. If you've prayed today to receive Jesus and you're watching online, send me an email at DwayneMiller.com. You say, well, I don't do email. Call the number on the screen this week. Watch us on VTN. Call that number. We want to help you. Would you stand to your feet today? I'm going to ask you today if you already know the Lord and you're thankful to God that He has loved you, forgiven you, He is ever present in your life every day. Would you just take a moment and lift your hands and just thank Him and worship Him today and just thank God for His mercy, His grace, His goodness, His love. Thank you, Jesus. You have the freedom here. Just pray in the Spirit if you want to. If you don't even have the words, just pray in the Spirit. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. something today before I close just stay in this Stubby come down here please buddy come down here hallelujah this dear friend dear dear friend of mine and Cameron's in this church it's a great man he loves this church he loves the Lord and while we were there actually we were on our way to Bethlehem I learned that his brother-in-law died and so I called Stubby on the way into Bethlehem and talk to him because they, they were close, close, close. I knew he was going to have to preach his brother-in-law's funeral, and he did. And would you just extend your hands to this man? Lord, I pray right now for my friend, Stubby, and I pray, God, for grace. Lord, there are many of us in this room today that know what it is to suffer loss. And the loss of people that we love, from spouses to siblings to parents. And God, I wish I had a formula that I could share with him and others on how to get through this, but I don't. But I do know that moment by moment and day by day, your grace is sufficient. And I do know that you can turn our tears of sorrow into smiles of joy. And I know that you used him greatly, even in this homegoing celebration to touch people's lives with the love of Jesus. And I pray that the life of his brother-in-law, the life of that family would continue to live on and touch people. Lord, I pray for comfort for this great man, for healing, for strength. Lord, I pray that day by day you would encourage and strengthen and lift his spirit. We break any and all of the unhealthy spirit of mourning off of him that might be there. And thank you that the mourning process will bring healing to his life. In the name of Jesus. I love you, buddy. Love you, man. Bless you. Hallelujah. Sweetie, you might have me that microphone right there. Cameron and I are going to come out to the foyer because I know we've got some first-time guests here today, and we want to give you a, a book or product or something that we could share with you. The, bo the box is back there for your tithes and offerings. If you're making out a check to the Edge Church, you can go online, dwaymiller.com, or 501-237-5676 is the text to give, 501-237-5676. Go to dwaymiller.com. You can sow your tithe there, here, by text. So as we leave here today, I want Trevor and Tasha to come back up here. I'm going to ask one of them, I don't care which one, I'm going to ask one of them to pray over you and pray that this anointing that we all brought home will just permeate you and bless you. every person in this house this morning, Father God, and the ones watching online. I pray today, Father God, that your spirit will come down and engulf them, Father, as they walk throughout this week, Lord God, that they begin to feel your love, your true love, Father God, that there is nothing that anyone in this room or out in that world could do, Father God, that you're not a forgiving God and that you don't love them. You're not chasing after them, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you will leave the 99 to find the one. So whoever is either watching online today or is in this room, 
that you don't think you're worthy enough for this love that we're talking about, I pray that he reigns and pours his love on you like the oil that Mary poured on Jesus' feet, like the tears that she wept, Father God, to wash your feet, that that love would consume them as they walk out this week, this anointing, Father God, that we have brought back, Lord, that it will consume the people in the name of Jesus, that every need will be met in this house. Every need will be met for the person that is watching online. That you will bring them in, Father God, from the north, south, east, and west to know your love, Father God. We praise you, Father God. We give you glory and honor, Father God. You are so worthy to be praised, Father. And I just speak peace, a shalom peace, Father God, over each person in the name of Jesus. We receive it, Father God. We receive your love. We receive your word in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for joining us today for our live broadcast. I pray that you were blessed by the message that was brought to you by my husband. And I pray that this week will be an anointed week for you and be blessings upon you. And Cameron and I want to personally invite you to join us live and in person every Sunday at 1030 at 6702 TP White Drive, Cabot, Arkansas. We'd love to meet you, give you a gift, and thank you for joining us. And thank you for listening to this message from our live service. Till next time, we'll see you on VTN. Thank mm-hmm. you.